morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. You know, one of the challenges of uh, speaking almost the fag end of a seminar is I run the risk of uh, repeating what my previous speakers have done. Um, so I had to literally change the presentation last night. A lot of good things have been said, so I, I did that. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to throw some additional light to what has already been uh, a great uh, event so far. So the topic uh, is opportunities and challenges for healthcare ID in India. You know, whenever we talk about opportunity, um, it's, it's kind of important to see uh, a timeline, right? Why is there an opportunity now, right? People talk about window of opportunity. So the question is, why is there an opportunity now? Hospitals have been in existence for so long. Um, so why are we talking about an opportunity now? What is changing? And how do we kind of uh, address those changes that are happening in the marketplace? So key market drivers, first thing is uh, actually health insurance penetration. If you really look back seven, eight years back, um, health insurance penetration was, uh, um, was happening mainly because of corporates taking insurance for their employees. But today there are three, four different things happening. One, um, corporates are definitely taking health insurance for their employees. Two, there's this big move towards health insurance uh, by mass insurance scheme, right? So the government is paying health insurance to private and public health insurance companies to treat poor patients for free in public and private hospitals, right? So the government could have done it in so many other ways, but they chose to do it this way, which means that people who didn't have money to take care of their health now suddenly is being paid for by health insurance companies and delivered by both public and private hospitals. So technically from a market, so in, in Tamil Nadu, there are a few states that are pioneering this. Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh are, uh, are two that we can speak of because they have been running this for quite some time. Uh, the health insurance premium is about 700 crores roughly that's being paid out. Uh, and a whole bunch of population is being covered. Now implication for hospitals, right, is suddenly the contribution from health insurance to the revenue of the hospitals or, uh, or diagnostic lab for that matter is, is changing uh, and changing very fast. The next big trend is uh, private equity funding in healthcare. Few years back, until like six, seven years back, uh, if you look at private equity funding in healthcare, there were very few players who got funded. But today, we can kind of list down 50 healthcare providers who have been uh, private equity venture funded. Now the implication of uh, private equity venture funding are few, right? Uh, one is, um, you know, the moment private equity money comes in, there has to be scale. Uh, it has to be run uh, to scale. So which means, if it has to be run to scale, the business needs to be standardized to best possible extent and rolled out to uh, multiple centers, right? Then unless we have a reasonable ID system in place, this kind of standardization and scaling becomes next to impossible. So the next key driver is private equity healthcare funding uh, in the Indian market. The third is big government push for healthcare ID adoption. Uh, you know, we have a lot of speakers uh, talk about it. Uh, it's happening at many levels. The first level is obviously the state governments are going after e-health projects in big way. There are few states that are already in RFP stage. They are talking about connecting all the way from uh, ASHA worker to the medical hospital uh, in the state uh, across their hierarchy, which is, which is pretty good. The second thing that's happening is um, for central government health insurance schemes, right, they are mandating some form of standardization. So the hospitals that needs to be accredited or to be paid for by Central Government Health Insurance Scheme need to be, for example, an ABH accredited, right? Uh, so the implication is, which also is my next point, the implication is it's almost next to impossible to get uh, the standardization unless you have a reasonably sophisticated IT systems, right? The standards doesn't mandate any particular IT system, but however, to practically implement these standards in a way that is meaningful, and to sustain the implementation, uh, the sophistication in IT system has to, has to improve and improve drastically. Which is the fourth point, uh, standards adoption, NABH, JCI, NABL for diagnostic labs. So a whole bunch of uh, hospitals are going uh, for these certifications, which are having a big impact in uh, healthcare IT adoption. 
So just to quickly summarize, health insurance penetration, private equity funding, big government push and standard adoption are four very large drivers for healthcare IT adoption in the country. And if you think about it, none of these drivers were in existence in a big way five, six years back. So the ecosystem is changing and changing for good. Now, uh, you know, a few very specific implication of these market drivers is changing expectation from healthcare IT. So what used to be a simple data entry system, which is the best case, a no system, uh, you know, which is what it was uh, before, the expectation from healthcare IT system is changing and changing for good. So people are looking at automation uh, at, a, at a very high level, uh, which is driving, um, you know, uh, the market for healthcare IT. The second one is uh, multi-center operations. Given the country we are and size and, and, and population and different uh, idiosyncrasies of dealing with different uh, states and languages, more and more multi-centers are being set up. So which then means managing one center is one challenge, but then managing multiple centers and not sitting, not having the ability to sit obviously in all the centers is totally different challenge, right? So which is uh, a positive implication towards healthcare ID. Uh, increased complexity in health operations, which is primarily driven by uh, health insurance for, uh, in my view. Um, you know, before health insurance penetration was getting better, uh, the issue was the patient, the doctor needs to decide how much to charge the patient, or the hospital needs to decide how much to charge the patient. Patient has to decide whether it's possible to pay, uh, and, and that ended the matter in terms of uh, financial transaction. But just fast forward uh, where we are today. Uh, so I, I, I go with an insurance uh, policy. The first thing uh, we need to decide is, is this policy valid? Uh, what will be the co-payment? Which means how much the insurance company would pay and how much uh, the patient would pay? And what are the services for which the insurance company would pay? Um, and at what percentage of it would they pay? So, so the decision points are uh, are increasing and becoming more and more challenging as more and more insurance policies are rolled out. The enormity of the challenge uh, could be addressed only through automation, which is driving healthcare IT in a big way, right? The the other positive implication is professional managers in healthcare. The previous panelists uh, also spoke about it. We see. Uh, lot of talent coming outside from outside of healthcare uh, into the healthcare space which is very positive largely because uh, in healthcare we are doing a catch up in terms of healthcare IT in a big way and other industries have have done it uh, which means there's an opportunity to learn from what people have done in other industries and one of the way to seed it is to get people from other industries to help us out in the process uh, which is also happening in a big way right so you know, so these are market drivers, uh, but so what are we really talking about? So what is the opportunity that we're talking about? If you notice, uh, you know, I, ha I have put some numbers, and if you have sat through the presentation, you will see that uh, the numbers that I put is different from the, from the past speakers, and one that the past speaker has put actually, actually different from the one that put uh, in the first session. This is the starting point of the challenge in India. Frankly, today there is no easy way to figure out how many hospitals are there in India. There isn't any. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to take help if, uh, if there is a structured way to do it. We have been trying to get simple metric number of hospitals in India. Uh, there isn't any. Uh, so, so we picked up from different sources. We did top down, we went bottom up, uh, and it's roughly about 100,000 hospitals. When I, the next issue in definition of uh, hospital is, you know, in the, we call nursing homes, However, what we actually do in nursing homes is not the same as what's being done in nursing homes outside of India. So in nursing homes, we do things that we actually do in hospitals also. Right? So technically, nursing home is a, is a smaller hospital, which does slightly lesser bunch of services than what a larger hospital would do. Uh, so there is a definition uh, problem as well in defining the market size. Uh, roughly, there are about 60,000 nursing homes in India an average of 15 to 20 beds across the country and 35 to 40,000 hospitals. Uh, so that's where the number 100,000 comes from. For diagnostic labs, there are about 70,000 standalone diagnostic labs. Uh, these are labs that are not inside hospitals but are standalone diagnostic labs. 
Now, uh, very interesting things are happening in this uh, in diagnostic lab industry. It is growing at a at a at a significant uh, CAGR. However, what's happening is out of the 70,000 diagnostic labs that are there, 90% of the volume is being done by small labs. So 10% is done by large ones. So, but the small labs do not necessarily make a lot of money. Uh, but the industry is growing. Now, now how do you reconcile this, uh, this situation, right? On one side, the industry is growing. On the other side, 90% of the volume is still being done by small labs, but small labs don't make a lot of money. Right. So this is the current situation. Uh, so how do you reconcile this situation? What's, what we see as a trend there is diagnostic labs are becoming multi-center more and more. So either the smaller ones become part of a larger one or they become multi-center themselves, grow, or at some point in time um, find it difficult to deal with these large multi-center diagnostic labs that are coming in. From an opportunity standpoint, so that opens a lot of opportunities for cloud-based uh, uh, information systems because the moment you go multi-center, you need to have the ability to put the pieces together in a, in a common standardized single form. So there's a phenomenal upcoming opportunity for automation in uh, lab information system space. The last one is Dr. Clinics, 1.2 million. Don't ask me from where I got this number. Again, a bottom up, top down. There is no clear data. Um, and if anyone has it, I'll be happy to take it uh, after the event. Uh, however, the opportunity in, uh, in doctor clinics is um, frankly not a lot. Um, one of the prerequisites that we think uh, which is going to drive this market big time is uh, outpatient uh, insurance. The moment outpatient insurance kick in, uh, this segment is going to explode and, and explode in a way which is going to be uh, very positive for uh, healthcare IT adoption. Because in an outpatient setup, one needs to figure out how much the patient has to pay and how much the insurance company has to pay right then and there. But in an inpatient setup, obviously patient is admitted, so you still have two, three days time to figure that out. And, and all the normal, um, you know, uh, non-integrated processes that are happening today between the hospital and the insurance company is doable in an inpatient setup but it's totally not possible in an outpatient setup. So the moment outpatient insurance kicks in, uh, it, it's going to explode the opportunity uh, in uh, the doctor clinic space. The solution, uh, you know, I, of course I'm a little biased because I, I run a cloud-based uh, business, so I would, I would obviously have to say it's cloud-based. Um, but I think truly it is cloud-based because uh, if you look at where the customers are, they are all over the place. If you look at how much they can pay, probably cloud makes it easier for them to pay in terms of local, local uh, total cost of ownership. Uh, if you look at how easy or difficult it is for vendors like us to service this wide mass of customers, cloud makes it easier for us to service. Given all these things, uh, there are a whole bunch of challenges that one needs to address when we are addressing uh, these market segments. So what are the key considerations? The first one is really product market fit. Now, yeah, we did speak about 100,000 hospitals, 70,000 labs, 1.2 million clinics, but they are really not homogeneous. It is impossible to build a system that serves for all in these markets that have been defined. Even in a hospital segment of 100,000 hospitals, there are a whole bunch of different expectations depending on where the hospital comes from, what is the uh, expectation from the hospital owner, what kind of scale they are talking about, what level of automation they are looking at. Right? So a 50-bed hospital in a, in a tier 2 town, their expectation from IT is very different from a 50-bed hospital which is a specialist center uh, in a city expecting EMR adoption, right? So product market fit, fit becomes uh, extremely important. So IT vendors need to think through this carefully. Now there are two definitions, right? One is the product, the other one is the market. So now which goes first? Ideally the market should go first. So, so we identify what is the market that we want to go after and then build or configure the product accordingly. In a cloud-based setup, what also happens is it is not easy to customize for all the needs of each and every individual hospital. Now because customization is, is particularly more challenging in a cloud-based environment, 
how do we handle the situation where we have to look at mass adoption? Now, one of the ways people handle mass adoption is not to try and solve all the problem, but take a point problem, right? So, CRM, for example, right? Uh, human capital management, for example. Now, no one is looking at big ERP, but specific point solutions because then you can build the functionality deep so that the from, uh, requirements for customization are very minimal. So product market fit becomes critical. If product market fit is not uh, good, then the ability to scale for an IT vendor is very minimal. If the ability to scale is minimal, uh, then economically it's not viable. Right? So the first consideration is really product market fit. The next one is uh, ability to reach. Right? I mean, there are, these are hospitals and labs that are all over the place. How do we get to them? In a cloud model, normally uh, in US and in other developed nations, people actually buy online. Right? So they go online, look it up, uh, buy some self-service, so they are able to set up these uh, software instances uh, by themselves uh, with some backend support centrally. So which means it is very low touch in terms sales and implementation. This model doesn't work in India. So we have to figure out a way to reach out to them in a not so low touch manner because people don't buy online as yet. The second challenge with this is then how do we implement these uh, solutions. From an implementation standpoint also low touch doesn't work uh, for, for reasons that I will talk about uh, down the line uh, that the level of uh, end user maturity is still not very high so which means there is an expectation from for the IT vendor to handhold customers so that the implementation is successful now this is particularly painful for a cloud-based SaaS company because if the implementation is not successful no one is going to pay the monthly fee and if no one is going to pay the monthly fee the model again is broken so ability to reach customer and ability to make sure that the implementation is successful uh, is a critical challenge uh, that needs to be looked at for this market. The next issue is a SaaS versus license. Uh, normally, customers are used to buying these enterprise systems from a systems integrator. Now, how does a systems integrator model work? There is a license component. Systems integrator puts the pieces together, hardware, networking, uh, implementation service, and the software. And they take a cut on the software. So in a license model, for a $500,000 software, they take a 20% cut you know, which is like $100,000, which makes sense for them. Now, if it's a monthly rental model, they will make probably $1,000 a month. There are not many SIs whose business model is, is kind of fitting for this kind of a monthly rental recurring model. So the channel ecosystem has not evolved for scale uh, in our geography. The third is uh, internet connectivity and cloud ecosystem. Um, you know, we have very interesting cases of internet connectivity because I just want to mention two specific cases. We have customers in Delhi who are having serious internet connectivity problems. Okay. Don't ask me why. Uh, it beats me. Uh, could be because they are in a military zone, but we went and checked out they are not. Uh, they are in uh, prime time Delhi area, but still internet connectivity is not good. However, I have a customer in... Uh, in Virudachalam, which is you know, tier 2 or tier 3 in Tamil Nadu, where the internet connectivity is brilliant. Right? No compliance, they are using the system beautifully. Um, so how do you explain this, right? What we think is areas where the fiber has already been laid out. For example, in Virudachalam, there is some connectivity already. And the tele-density is not very high, which means the 4 Mbps broadband that is brought in Virudha Chalam actually performs much better than if you buy a 4 Mbps broadband in Chennai because the tele density in Chennai is much more so there are more number of users logging on to the same network while in a, in a tier 3 town there are less number of users who are logging on to the same network. So this could be the possible explanation uh, and we think this is the explanation but however what we also see on the positive side is uh, 4G being rolled out. Uh, you know, Reliance, Geo announced a 70,000 crore investment in, uh, in rollout of 4G. So internet connectivity is only going to get better and better. However, today at the stage we are in, uh, it's not optimal. 
The cloud ecosystem is also not very good. When we started, I had to buy a server, put it in the data center. That's all we could do with cloud. But today, uh, there are cloud players coming up. You know, Dell is uh, Dell is coming out in big wave. You know, TCS is, is is doing it. There are other cloud providers. So, from an ecosystem standpoint, there is a drastic improvement from the time when we started and where we are today. And I think the trend is going to be positive. The fourth uh, security uh, thing. I just have two more minutes left, so very quickly, I'll security uh, from a customer standpoint. Uh, it's not about who is going to hack the data. It's about uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, will my competitors get to know about my patients? Will the hospital next door will will uh, will take my patients because they get access to the data? Uh, we are addressing it in uh, from a process standpoint, technology standpoint, uh, and also from a uh, look at it for, as a sales objection. Like how pricing is a sales objection, security also a sales objection. Technically, I would go ahead and argue cloud is much more secure than uh, what one could think of. Other very quickly. From a customer side, uh, you know, there's very high attrition in healthcare uh, industry, hospitals and labs. So, which means you go and implement, train them, make sure they use the system, go back after six months, 10% of the users are not there, which means you have to retrain and make sure they continue to use the system. Otherwise, you're not going to get paid and it is not of best interest for either the hospital or lab or for the uh, vendor himself. The in house development, how do I say this? Uh, some People think we can build a system by putting engineers together inside a hospital or inside a lab. It doesn't work like that. Uh, from an upgrade standpoint, from a, from a, from your ability to continue uh, to upgrade and support the system, it is very different from an in-house development to a to a product implementation usage, which we spoke about. The last one is pricing and collection. In a monthly rental and a cloud-based model. Uh, how you price and your ability to collect is critical. Um, given the collection ecosystem is also not very good, uh, you know, you have to set up processes to make sure customers pay on time and you get your money on time. If those two doesn't happen, in any case, the model is broken. Uh, so from a challenges standpoint, there are a wide variety of challenges. However, uh, market size is appealing. Uh, people who figure out a model to address specific market size are going to uh, really do very well in the Indian healthcare ID market. 